early by my watch, but uh, I looked at a few different times today, and they were all different, one in the car, one on the phone, and one on the watch, so I'll go by near enough. But we're going to commence, please, tonight by turning to the hymn number 40, the hymn number 40, O worship the King, all glorious above, O gratefully sing his power and his love. The hymn number 40, and we'll stand together, please, as we sing. Let's still our hearts before the Lord in prayer. Let us just come and seek the Lord and ask even the Lord to draw near to us tonight as we would seek to draw near unto him. Heavenly Father, we bow before thee in prayer this evening in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus. And we thank thee tonight for the great privilege we have to draw near unto thee, the one true and living God. We thank thee tonight that as your people, saved by your grace, redeemed by the precious blood, that we can address thee as our Father in heaven. We thank thee tonight we can say with the Apostle John, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, 
that we should be called the sons of God. Oh, we thank thee tonight for the great standing we have before thee in the Lord Jesus. We acknowledge that in and of ourselves we are but sinners, deserving of thy wrath and judgment. But we thank thee that in thy mercy and grace thou hast put us into thy Son, that we are united to him by faith. And we rejoice, we can say tonight, that being justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We can say tonight that there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And Father, we come tonight and we realize that even this day we have sinned, but we thank thee that if we confess our sins, that thou art faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we seek that fresh cleansing tonight, for we thank thee that if we walk in the light, as thou art in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ thy Son cleanseth us from all sin. And so, Father, tonight we seek that fresh cleansing from sin. We seek also that fresh infilling of thy Holy Spirit. We thank thee for the words of the Savior when he said, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And we ask even afresh for the infilling of thy Spirit, that we might even know help tonight to seek thy face in prayer, that we might know help to even sing thy praise, and to hear thee speaking to us through the reading and the preaching of thy word. Father, we thank thee tonight for even the freedom and liberty that permits us to come together in this fashion. We're mindful tonight of some of your people in other parts of this world. They have not the same freedom. They have not the same liberty. But Lord, we pray tonight that we will not even take for granted this freedom and liberty to come and assemble in this fashion. We thank thee also tonight for a measure of health and strength that allows each of us to be here. We thank thee tonight for ordering our circumstances that we're able to be here. And above all, we thank thee for that desire that thou dost place within our hearts as your people to assemble together, even to meet with thee. And Lord, tonight we do remember thy servant who normally ministers in this place. We pray for your blessing to be upon him. And we ask, Lord, that you'd remember even his labors for thee in this corner of thy vineyard. We are mindful tonight of even those in many of our other congregations who'll be meeting together in a similar fashion. And Lord, we pray that you would bless wherever your people meet tonight. We thank thee for the promise of thy presence. We thank thee for the promise of the presence of the Savior where the two or three are gathered together in his name. And we pray tonight that we'll be conscious of thy presence with us. We ask even as we do further sing thy praise, that we will sing even out of hearts filled with praise to thee for who thou art and what thou hast done for us. We ask as we turn to thy word that thou will come and speak to us through thy word, that thou wilt minister to each of our hearts Lord, tonight then, as we seek thy face together in prayer, we ask that thou will guide us in the place of prayer, that thou will pour out that spirit of prayer and supplication in our hearts tonight. We are mindful tonight of those that are not able to gather, and we are conscious tonight there are those who would be here if they were able. We pray you'd remember those of your people who are shut in and led aside May they know thy presence with them in a special manner. And Father, tonight, as each one of us are bowed before thee, we're conscious that each of us have different needs, different burdens are borne, different trials are faced. But we thank thee tonight we can cast our cares upon thee, knowing that thou dost care for us. And so we ask that you would come now and shut us in 
with yourself for this time, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn, please, to another hymn, 633. 633. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. 633, and we'll stand again, please, as we sing. Let's turn tonight, please, to the Psalms and to the Psalm number two. The Psalm number two, and let us read this Psalm together. The Psalm number two. And here the psalmist asks the question. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth 
and the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Amen. And we know God will bless the reading of his word to your hearts this evening. On that evening of the first day of the week, when the Lord Jesus had arisen from the dead, you can read at the end of Luke chapter 24 how the Lord Jesus appeared to the eleven and others who were gathered with them in Jerusalem. And he said to them on that occasion, These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. And we read then of how the Lord Jesus opened the understanding of his disciples that they might understand the Scriptures. And he pointed out to them how, of course, the Old Testament Scriptures had prophesied that he would have to suffer and die, and rise again. And those things had been fulfilled. And he also said that now repentance and remission of sins was to be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And of course, those disciples to whom he spoke, he was able to say to them that they were witnesses of these things. They were witnesses of the fact that what the prophets had prophesied had been fulfilled as far as the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus was concerned and as far as his resurrection was concerned. And of course, they would also witness the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and they would go forth to preach and to witness in the name of the risen Savior. When we come to this second psalm tonight, keeping in mind that the Lord Jesus had spoken of those things that had been written of him, not only in the prophets and in the law of Moses, but also in the Psalms, it's very clear as you read this psalm that the Lord Jesus is spoken about. And of course, when you turn over to the New Testament to Acts chapter 4 and the verses 25 and 26, you will find the record of a prayer meeting which took place. A prayer meeting where some of the very words in this second psalm were prayed over, prayed over by the servants of the Lord, prayed over because some of their number had been told no longer to preach in the name of Christ. 
and when they had been let go in Acts 4 and verse 23, they went to their own company and they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And then in verse 24 we read, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea, and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, and here we have this quotation from the second psalm, why did the heathen reach and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth, Against thy holy child Jesus are beginning now to apply the psalm, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles. And the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And here they're quoting from this psalm. They're applying it to what had happened even in their day. And of course, they go on to offer prayer and to ask of oh, the Lord. And of course, as we assemble here tonight, we're here not only to look into the Word of God, but to seek the Lord in prayer. And I want us tonight to come to this second psalm and overview its message. This psalm can be divided into four parts. And I want us just to overview the message of the psalm as we come even to seek the Lord in prayer tonight and ask ourselves, what is the message of this psalm? There was a message in this psalm that God's people there in Acts 4 were very clear about as they quoted the psalm and prayer to the Lord. And of course, there is a message in this psalm that is just as relevant and up to date for you and I tonight as we come even to the place of prayer. As we think upon this psalm and the truths that are set before us tonight, I want you to see, first of all, that this psalm sets before us the rebellion of sinners. The rebellion of sinners. The rebellion of sinful mankind. You and I know, as the Lord's people tonight, that all mankind are born in sin. And by nature, we are all born as rebels against the God who has given us life and breath. And it's only through God's mercy and grace and through his salvation that any of us have been turned from that rebellion and brought into submission to the God who has given us life and breath. And of course, that is only possible because of the great work of the Lord Jesus, whereby, by the shedding of his blood, he has made peace through the blood of his cross, and made that way of reconciliation for you and I as sinners. And here in the opening three verses of this psalm, the psalmist sets before us the rebellion of sinners, the rebellion of sinful mankind. And as David penned this psalm, and of course there in Acts 4 we're left in no doubt it was David who penned the psalm, but it's as if David is somewhat amazed at the terrible rebellion of sinful mankind. He asks the question there, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine and think, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? When we read there of the heathen raging, the word carries the meaning of a tumult, a commotion, a conspiracy, a plot. Why do the heathen rage? Why do the people imagine a vain thing? That is, why do the people devise or speak of that which is empty and worthless. 
You see, to rebel against God and to somehow think that you will benefit from rebelling against God, the great creator, that's, that's a vain thought. That's a worthless thought. And there are many in this world tonight and they think they can benefit from being in rebellion against God. And yet, it's an empty, worthless thought that somehow sinful mankind can benefit and get the better of the God that they rebel against. The second verse of the psalm sheds a little more light on the rebellion of sinful mankind. Because we learn that even the kings of the earth and the rulers who are given their authority from God, that even among their number, so many of them use their position of authority to rebel against God. Here the psalmist says the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And you see many of the rulers and the kings of this world, they may have many differences, but see how they unite together to rebel against God and his word, and his law, and his ways. Because they take counsel together against the Lord. They are united in their rebellion against God. No matter how many differences they might have, the one to the other, and against his anointed, against his Christ. And see what they say in verse 3, which again brings out what their sinful rebellion is all about. Verse 3, they're saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords or must they do not want to be under the restraint of God and his law and his way as they want to do their own thing. They want to make their own laws. They want to indulge in their own sinful pleasure. And of course, whether it be the kings of the earth, whether it be the rulers, whether it be the individual that's being ruled over by nature, these verses set before us what is in all our hearts by nature and what is still in the hearts of those that are still out of Christ and have not submitted themselves even to him. It's the spirit that we see all around us in the world today, in our own land, in our own nation, and throughout the nations of the world. And the same spirit was evident in the days in which the Savior walked upon this scene of time. And of course, it comes out clearly there, even in Acts chapter 4, in that prayer meeting. Oh yes, the Savior at that point, he'd already suffered on to death. He'd been buried. He had risen again. He had ascended back to heaven. The Holy Spirit has been poured out in the day of Pentecost. And in that chapter 4, and even of Acts in the chapter 3, as the Lord's servants had preached and, and witnessed, this rebellion against God had been seen. They had been arrested. They had been threatened. They had been told to speak no longer in the name of Jesus there in Acts 4 at verse 18. They called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. And of course, there are many in this world today who would want to say the same to God's people, preach no more, teach no more in the name of Jesus. The rebellion of sinners, the rebellion of sinful mankind. And there in Acts chapter 4 and the verses 25 and 26, when the Lord's servants in prayer quoted from this psalm, and they apply it particularly in their context, there in verse 27, to Herod and Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, 
the people of Israel and how they gather together, of course, to cry out for the Lord Jesus to be crucified. And yet at the same time, in verse 28, they were doing whatsoever God's hand and God's counsel had determined before to be done. In other words, the rebellion of sinful mankind cannot hinder the purpose of God for the salvation of his people and for all that he has planned in this world. And as the Lord's servants here prayed over the psalm, as we've already said, the Lord Jesus had already been crucified. He'd been buried. He had arisen. He had appeared, of course, for those 40 days. Then he had ascended up into heaven. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. And they are themselves suffering from the rebellion of sinful mankind as they preach. But they're coming and they're, they're praying to their God. The God who they know is over all despite the rebellion of sinful mankind. And in fact, they're asking in verse 29 of Acts 4 for the Lord to behold the threatenings of those who had threatened them. And they're praying that with all boldness they might continue to speak God's word. And they're asking the Lord to demonstrate his power as they would continue to preach. And their prayers are answered in verse 31. Because they are all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they're able to continue to speak the word of God with boldness. And you know we look around us tonight and we see continually the rebellion of sinful mankind. As God's word is preached as you would seek to be a witness for the Lord. And despite the rebellion of sinful mankind, we're still to keep on preaching and witnessing and keep on praying because the Lord still has a people to see. Him. And he will continue to work out his great purpose, whether it be among the rulers of this world or among those that are just looked upon as the individual upon the street. And you know, this sinful rebellion of mankind against God and against his Christ, we know it will continue right until that day when the Savior returns. Over in the book of Revelation chapter 19, and the verse 19, as the Apostle John penned these words concerning what he was given an insight into concerning even the future. In Revelation 19, in the verse 19, he wrote, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together. Here again are the kings, and they're gathered together with this united purpose to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. They have a purpose to war against the Savior, even right until that day when the Savior returns again. Remember Saul of Tarsus? What was he doing when he was heading along the road to Damascus? He was breathing out those threatenings and slaughter against the followers of Christ. And of course, the Lord stopped him in his tracks. Of course, the Lord saved him. And he became the one who then also suffered at the hands of the rebellion of sinful mankind, the rebellion he had been guilty of, till the Lord stopped him and saved him. And so this psalm too <laughs> reminds us of what is evident all around us, what was evident in our own hearts before the Lord saved us, the rebellion of sinners. But I want you to see in the second place the response of the sovereign. Because when you get to verse 4 of the psalm, you will read of how God responds to the sinful rebellion of mankind. We might ask the question, is God in fear? That the rebellion of sinful mankind and the nations and the rulers... Of course not, because he is the sovereign God. 
with almighty power. Remember what we read in the book of Daniel and the chapter 4 and the verse 35. The book of Daniel and the chapter 4 and the verse 35. And of course, these words were spoken by Nebuchadnezzar, a king who had great power in this world. And yet he'd come to realize that any power he had was an authority was given by God and could be taken away by God. And so in Daniel 4 and 35, he said, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? And here in Psalm 2, we have the same thought being set before us as we think of the response of the sovereign. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He sits in the heavens. There's a calmness. There's also a contempt toward those who would rise up in rebellion against him. Verse 5, it says, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. The response of the sovereign. He derides those who rebel against him. He laughs, but he also speaks in his wrath. You can follow through a few references in the Psalms to the Lord laughing if you come forward to Psalm 37, and the verses 12 and 13. How many there are among Sinful mankind, who as it were would shake their fist at God. And yet we read here in Psalm 37, verses 12 and 13, The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth, because of course the wicked will plot against those who follow God and follow the Saviour. But verse 13 says, The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. And again, the thought is, well, of course, God knows that sinful mankind cannot succeed or benefit from rebelling against him. There's another verse in Psalm 59. And the verses 7 and 8 Psalm 59, the verses 7 and 8. Behold, they bell shout with their mouth. Swords are in their lips, for who say they doth hear? But thou, O Lord, shall laugh at them. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. Here's the response of the sovereign to the rebellion of sinful mankind. And as we come back there to Psalm 2, the verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. What a solemn thing is the wrath of God against the rebellion of sinful mankind. He'll vex them in his sore displeasure. It ought to make us so grateful to the Lord for his mercy and grace shown toward us. For we deserve that wrath. We deserve that sore displeasure. God has turned us from our rebellion and he saved us. And he's brought us into his family, into that place of being reconciled to him. When Paul was writing to the Thessalonians, he reminded them in 2 Thessalonians 1 that for those who are not brought to turn from their sin on that day when, when Christ returns, that, that his wrath will be 
so evident because in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7, as Paul wrote to believers who were suffering at the hands of the rebellion of sinful mankind, he wrote to them in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in the saints. What mercy and grace that the Lord should come to be glorified in we as his people. Though we be deserving of that vengeance and that everlasting destruction. And of course it ought to burden us for those that are lost that we might even see them one to the Savior. So this psalm sets before us the rebellion of sinners. It sets before us the response of the sovereign. And of course there in the verse 6, the sovereign God can say, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, despite those who have risen up against me and against my anointing. And it brings us then to your third thought, the reign of the Son. That is the reign of the Son of God. H having said there in verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Then in verse 7 we read, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, here, here is the Savior now speaking, the King. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. God's King is set upon his holy hill of Zion. The Lord Jesus is the one who reigns, who will come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Remember what was said to Mary. In Luke's gospel, when the angel Gabriel came to tell her of how she would conceive in her womb and she would give birth to a son that was to be called Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, in verse 32, the angel said concerning the Lord Jesus, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Remember when the wise men came, they came asking, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And you know when... In Acts 2, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and he spoke of the fact, yes, the Lord had been crucified. He'd been buried, but he'd arisen. And he'd been exalted to the right hand of the Father. Acts 2 and the verse 32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David has not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Here is the king. Here is the son who reigns and will come again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Again in the book of the Revelation, this time the chapter 11 and the verse 15, John sees the seventh angel sounding 
in Revelation 11, in the verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord, and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the Bible says we will reign with him as his people. What a privilege. You know, back in the Psalm 2, when it speaks of the king, the reign of the Son of God. We read of how the Lord said to him in verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Christ intercedes for his people. He prays for those whom he has saved and those whom he will yet save. And someday in heaven there will be a multitude out of every tongue and every nation and every people who will be gathered to Christ as his people. And of course, every knee is going to bow to him. Even those who are not his people. The reign of the Son. He is our King. He's the King of saints. And of course, we are to pray as we pray for the salvation of sinners, that others will be brought now in time to bow to Him as the King, King of their hearts and lives. But we conclude by just mentioning at the end of the psalm, while yes, we've seen the rebellion of sinners, the response of the sovereign, the reign of the son, what about the reception of salvation? You and I, see it by God's grace, have received the salvation that the king, the son, the savior has purchased. And at the end of this psalm, because, of course, the kings of the earth have been mentioned. There is a call and an exhortation given to the kings, but, of course, it's applicable to all mankind. In verse 10, it says, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. There's a call that goes out even to the kings and the rulers, but, of course, to all mankind. Serve the Lord with fear. And rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, here's mention of his wrath again. And there's that call to, to embrace the son by faith, to receive his salvation. And then there's that benediction at the end, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. What a blessing to receive this salvation. And we know that in our own experience. We've been blessed by God. He has saved us. He's brought us to a place in our lives where we've received this salvation and we are to continue then to serve him with fear, and to rejoice with trembling. And we are to take the message of the gospel to others, to call them to be wise, to embrace the Son by faith. To experience this blessing of trusting in Him. And that they might also be able to serve Him with fear. And to rejoice with trembling. We think then of this psalm. We see what we wear in our rebellion. We see what Christ has purchased for our salvation. And we see how blessed we are. What reason we have to ask of God tonight. Yes, to thank him for all he has done for us. But to ask that he might come and work in other hearts and lives. That he might come and revive our hearts. That he might come and get glory to his name 
even through us, and in these days in which we live. And so may the Lord even bless his word to your hearts tonight for his name's sake. Well, maybe just sing one verse of a hymn before we come to prayer. It's 638, 638. It says, visit us, Lord, with revival, stricken with coldness and death. Where is our hope of survival? Safe in thy life-giving breath. 638, and we'll just stand to sing the first verse and the chorus, please. Well, we're glad to see you tonight and glad to be with you and we thank you for being here even in the place of prayer and as we come to seek the Lord in prayer well you know the needs of this congregation and your own needs better than I do but I suppose whatever congregation we gather in there are many needs are so similar there are souls to be saved there are backsliders to be restored as the Lord's people we always need to be revived and led on there are those that need a touch in body, those that need comfort in their hearts. And we can bring these needs before the Lord and pray even for the wider work of God as we come toward the end of one year. And if the Lord tarry and spare us as we enter even into a new year. So let's seek the Lord together and let me encourage you to make good use of the time tonight. And let us call upon the Lord. And as one prays audibly, let us all even pray along in our hearts tonight. Let us seek the Lord together. Father in heaven, we thank thee again tonight for the great privilege we have to draw nigh unto thee. And though we are deserving of thy wrath and thy judgment, we thank thee you have blessed us. For blessed are all they that put their trust in thee. Lord, left to ourselves, we would have went on in our sin and ended up in a lost eternity. But we thank thee that before the foundation of this world, thou didst set thy love upon us. And we thank thee in time you worked in our hearts and lives. And you brought us to that place where you enabled us to turn from our sin and by faith to embrace Christ the King as our Saviour as our Lord and King. Surely we can say with the words of the hymn writer, King of my life, I crown thee now. Oh, we thank thee that you have brought us into your kingdom. We thank thee that we've been born again of your spirit. And Lord, we've experienced your grace and your mercy. You're abundant, you're exceeding abundant mercy and grace. We thank Thee tonight, even as we come to Thee in prayer. We thank Thee it is because we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. We thank Thee with a great high priest who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And we thank Thee that by Your grace we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Father, as we bow before thee this, this evening, we are conscious that each one of us have many and varied needs. There are many and varied needs in each family circle, even bowed before thee. There are many needs within this congregation, indeed each of our congregations. There are many needs throughout the work of God. 
But we thank thee tonight we're coming to a God who is all-sufficient, a God who is sovereign over all, a God who has almighty power. And we therefore come and we spread the needs before thee tonight. We pray again tonight for those who have that greatest need of all, those who are still unsaved and out of Christ. And now to stow those that would be upon the hearts of your people here, that may be unsaved sons or daughters, may be unsaved husbands or wives, may be unsaved brothers or sisters, whatever the connection might be, we thank thee we can bring them to thee tonight. We have the desire, the same desire that Paul had when he said, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. Lord, surely it is our heart's desire and prayer for those in our families and among our friends and neighbors that they might be saved. Lord, we pray that you will work in hearts and lives even in the remaining days of this year. And we pray that in your mercy and grace you would save other souls. We pray tonight for the restoration of backsliders, those who once walked well with thee. Tonight finds them cold of heart, and bypass metal. Lord, restore unto such the joy of thy salvation. We pray for each child of God who is seeking to go on with thee. Lord, we know we can still be drawn closer to thee. We know we still need revived in our hearts. We need, Lord, to become more like our Savior. We need to be conformed more to his image. And so we pray that you will continue to Enable us to die more to sin, to live more unto Christ and righteousness. Help us to set our affection on things above and not on the things of this world. Help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that all these other necessary things will be added unto us. We ask tonight that you would remember every aspect of the work here and in each of our congregations, whether it be the work among the boys and girls in the Sunday school and the children's meetings, whether it be the regular Lord's Day services, whether it be special meetings that may be planned for the new year, we pray, Lord, that as one would plant and another would water, that thou wouldst give the increase. We pray that you'd remember our Bible college, remember those who are training for future ministry, remember the brethren who have finished their training and they're waiting thee on thee for an open door. Remember the vacant churches. Lead and guide them. We ask, Lord, that you remember our missionaries, whether it be our home missionaries, those who labor among the boys and girls, the young people, those who labor among the addicted, whether it be the missionaries who have gone to other parts of the world. Lord, we pray that you will bless their labors for thee. We pray you remember the work of let the Bible speak. Remember the work of our Christian schools. Every aspect of thy work connected with our denomination. Lord, we are conscious that without thee we can do nothing. But we thank thee we can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth us. And so, Lord, we thank thee for all of thy mercy and all of thy goodness shown throughout this year that will soon have passed into eternity. And Lord, we look to thee for your blessing, even in the year that lies ahead. Lord, we acknowledge that we, we look around us in our nation, in our land. There's much to discourage. There's much to distress. But we thank thee we can look up to thee. and We can know that thou art the one who art working all things after the counsel of thine own will. And we thank thee we also know that all things work together for good to them that love thee to them that are the called, according to thy purpose. So, Father, we ask that you would come now and give to each of us that spirit of prayer and supplication. Guide us in prayer tonight. Help us in the place of prayer. Continue with us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.